take a moment here. Um, so hello, ladies, gentlemen, smart contracts. <laughs> um, so I'm Dean Tribble. Uh, oh, do I have a clicker here? I do have a clicker. Aha, lovely. I'm Dean Tribble from Agoric, and we are a seed-funded startup company um, that is doing that has been doing uh, smart contract technology since before there were blockchains. Uh, individually, we just started this company recently, but our goal has always been to enable the entire world economy, not the tens of billions of dollars that are currently interested in smart contracts, but to enable the entire world economy to be able to move onto the decentralized networks um, and using smart contracts, succeeding at, at driving tens of trillions of dollars of transactions across the entire diverse kinds of activities that humans engage in. And the goal is to do that safely. So, you know, we're nothing if not ambitious. We obviously can't do that ourselves. We can't do it even with the people in this room or in this conference. Or with this button. Oh, should I point at you or what? Let's see. Aha, there we go. All right, I will point at you. Um, okay, so yes, it's too big. We need the tens of millions of programmers in the world that currently wake up and go and solve some problem. If we want to decentralize the economy, we need them to be using that technology successfully. Right? And right now, they can't do that. There are a couple of obstacles. The first is hard and long-term and interesting. I don't know if you remember 10, 15 years ago when people made web applications. They had HTML, they had early versions of JavaScript, they had CSS, and you'd kind of glue them together and you could get some amount of event reaction and a little bit of responsiveness and some a bit of smarts. But the really slick, really secure, really expressive, responsive, reactive applications that we're used to now on the web are all built with frameworks. That's what we mean by frameworks, is the difference between the UIs you had 15 years ago and you know, Airbnb and you know, those kinds of things now, where they're built using React, Angular, Vue that has direct support for the activities that they engage in. It directly supports menus and data feeds from their system databases. They don't have to cobble it together from, uh, uh, from, from items and HTML lists and so forth. And so we need that for all of the programmers that, that are used to that level of functionality and tool support and error checking and so forth to be able to succeed at taking their current application development and making that be uh, decentralized smart contracts. We also need to solve the security model problem. It's clear that even now, that, that now on current smart contracting platforms, even experts can't get the security right. They end up with breaches that lose tens of millions of dollars in minutes with no recourse. So the, the environment in which smart contracts run, it's very exciting, there's a lot of opportunity there, but it's also pretty hostile, and we need to solve that security problem, and we need to solve it in a way that normal, everyday developers focused on their use case that they're an expert in will be able to succeed at making safe smart contracts that solve their problems. Um, so, what is a smart contract? The definition we've worked with for 10 years or more, a contract-like arrangement expressed in source code um, where the behavior of the program enforces the terms of the contract. Right? So, Bitcoin, that's really enforcing the arrangement of transfer and so forth in the code of Bitcoin, so that is an example of a, of, of a smart contract. But obviously we've gotten much richer. Ethereum has opened up a whole new realm where people can do programming of arbitrary programmer's use cases instead of just the one that's built into the system. <clears throat> um, so if I were to write a program, you know, a simple smart contract, uh, that was a ticket to a concert that I'm going to put on, right? And I could write a fairly simple program of that where I'm going to provide tickets and I want to be able to send, send, send to people. In the current systems, like Ethereum and, and based on their security model, in those systems, in order to send you that ticket, in order to give you that ticket, I would have to have your public identity, your, your address in Ethereum or a public key or, or some kind of name, and embed that in the smart contract. Right, so that now it knows that of all the people in the world that come to redeem this ticket, you're the one that's allowed to do it. 
right? And that model, um, uh, you know, that kind of comes from our use of Windows and, and, and Unix and so forth. But what it means is if I gave you a ticket and you wanted to sell it to a friend of yours or give it to a buddy or what have you, you would need permission to change the contents of that smart contract to replace your name with theirs, your identity with theirs, your address with theirs on Ethereum. And that's hard. That requires that for me to provide you a ticket that can do that, I have to do a lot more implementation. Right? I have to support that behavior on your part, and that's more code, more opportunity for bugs, and in particular, it's code that is security sensitive. It's about the security of the system, and bugs there are the things that result in losses. Let's go to the next slide. That model, what we call the uh, identity-based access control, oh, do I control it? Ah, oh, I control it this time, all right. Um, the the identity-based access control model bakes the notion of owner into the contract, impedes transfer, even if it's possible after adding enough epicycles to do that, and prevents dynamic exchange of right. It prevents me from selling it to you, you from turning around and selling it to a friend, a friend from building a smart contract that will sell it for a fixed price up, up until next Saturday, which is effectively right a covered call, but it's a new, interesting smart contract that's going to engage in interesting market behavior. It prevents him from taking that smart contract that, for, for the covered call and selling it on yet another exchange. So all of that difficulty makes it, makes it hard to grow an economy of smart contracts working, to each other, working with each other. And we can see where this came from, right? Our legacy security systems are really around human to computer interface, where I'm using a computer, I come to a job, I get access to some resources, maybe in six months I get promoted, and, and I get a few more resources, but things don't change very much. But if you remember the definition I just had of smart contracts, they're all about changing who has what rights, right? Their whole purpose uh, for, for, for existing is to enable so that I can do a sale or a transaction or an interesting arrangement such that something that I have is made available to someone else or, some, or they're paying for a service that I have, but goods and services are moving back and forth dynamically as a result of the behavior of the contract. And the identity-based access control model is well known that it doesn't support that really well. It su maybe supports that static arrangement I have with my employer, but it doesn't support dynamically changing on a second-by-second -second basis who has access to what parts, of, what, what parts of the computer or what kinds of data or what kinds of digital assets. So we have a different model. This is a model that comes from secure operating systems like SEL4 and Kikos and Microsoft's Midori. Um, and it's called the, the Object Capability Model or the OCAP model. And an OCAP, an Object Capability, an OCAP, formally, may I introduce you, is a transferable, unforgeable authorization to use the object it designates. Now, you only need that formal definition if you are, if you are building a crypto arrangement to have the same properties or architecting an operating system that needs to have those properties so that you can tap into the long history of analysis of security properties of this and how to build composable systems in the abstraction. But in a programming language, which is where most of us will encounter this model and most of us will be building smart contracts, it's just a strongly encapsulated object. So an OCAP system, an object capability system, is a system where we start with objects. We start with objects like C Sharp, like Java, like JavaScript, and we build up abstractions for doing security on the one hand or market cooperation, market activity on the other. And so here I'm going to focus on the market activity, but indeed secure operating systems and secure systems out there have been built with this model multiple times. So let's, talk, let's look at a simple um, uh, uh, OCAP, a simple object capability. So here, this is JavaScript, but again, it could be any of several languages. Um, we have a make entry and exit counter. For that concert I had, right, I want to be able to count the number of people inside the venue. So it's got a count and entry. I can, you know, click the ticker to say who's come in, and I can click another ticker to say who's gone out. And on the right is using it, where I make a counter for my concert. And if you're familiar with JavaScript, this pattern of counter.count entry, it's pulling off the method as a new object. That's just a shortcut in JavaScript. But think of it as just another object. And so the model of provisioning rights and authority in the OCAP model is, yeah, entry guard, the guy who I hired, here you are, you know, or the contract, the system, the front end gatekeeper. I'm just going to say, here, use this object to count entry. 
And now I have given him access, I have authorized him, and the only thing he can do on my entry system here is increment the number of people that came in. And similarly, I give to the exit guard the count exit so he can decrement the number of people that, that are still in the venue. And never the twain shall meet. If the guy who's, who's managing the entry gate leaves and hands it off to, to Jane, Jane picks up that capability and now she's the one that's, that, that's able to click that ticker. And so the authority is vested in a bearer instrument. It's something that I can transfer from person to person. So that's a simple example. What does this look like when you're doing a mechanism for market cooperation? Right, a simple ledger, we have, for, for a simple ledger kind of function, we have what are called mints that make currency, that make new currencies, and they produce a purse full of that currency. Right, so those are the operations. I can make a mint with a given name. Uh, given a mint, I can produce a new purse with a certain amount of that, uh, that, that currency. With a purse, oh, it shifted from one thing to another, so it wrapped a little. But I can ask for a purse, how much has it got? Um, we'll talk about issue in a minute. And I can deposit, I'll point here, shorts purse it wrapped, and I apologize. I can deposit one purse full of, cur of that currency into another purse of the same currency. And this is important, deposit will only work, and this is just a straightforward object pattern written in JavaScript, this is all implemented and running. Um, in, 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 our, in our playground VAT, our proof of concept system. But um, uh, that deposit takes, a, if, if it gets a purse that is not in the same currency, the deposit fails because, of course, you can't deposit apples into a purse full of oranges, right? Um, so, it, so it only succeeds if you actually gave me a purse of the currency I'm expecting. So how does that get used? Well, for my concert that I'm putting on, I mint a new currency, which is tickets to the concert. Poof, I've got a new currency, right? Now, when I want to, when, when in some operation in my smart contract for managing, the, ma managing this contract, this, this concert, um, I'm requested a ticket, I mint one token, one unit of this currency, and I return it. And now they have a purse with one concert ticket in it. Obviously, if they were doing bulk orders, I could return them four tickets, but that's not what we're doing here. Okay, so I could also just mint a ticket and send it to Carol, right? I've got some API, some economic arrangement, so I invoke her receive ticket function, and now Carol receives, as an argument, simple argument passing in your object-oriented programming language, receives a ticket, okay? Well, this isn't quite what you need for a smart contract and for cooperation here. Because, remember, these are simple objects, right? There's nothing magic here. It's something that, again, tens of millions of programmers in the world could trivially use this kind of library and do this sort of thing all the time. But what happens with objects when I pass them is I share them. So now Carol has the ticket, but so do I, right? So what do we do? So now where we get to that issuer that I mentioned. An issuer on a mint is effectively like a brand that I can use to verify that a given purse is indeed part of, you know, a, a different, a given ticket or a different element of currency is indeed part of that particular currency. So it has the operation get exclusive is the primary one where I don't go through the process of saying, hey, are you a currency? If so, I'm going to go do this other thing. I just have an operation that cuts out the middleman that says, I just got something that claims to be a ticket for this concert. Um, Give me the real ticket for this concert. And if that works, I'm good, and I'm the, the only person that has that. So we'll walk through that in a moment. So at the top, that initial setup that I did where I created this new currency for the concert, I create the currency for the concert, and now I get the issuer for that currency, and I make it available somewhere that people can use it. In my particular example here, I sent a message to the venue you know, to publish my new concert event, and here's the, 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 the issuer that will validate people's tickets for entry. Right? And so now anyone can tell whether they got a valid ticket for that concert. So Carol, who's the one who received the ticket I sent her, um, what she's going to do when she gets that ticket in her receive ticket call um, is she's going to go to that concert issuer and say, great, I've got something that claims to be a ticket. Let me claim it. Right? And it's, you know, it's not claiming. It's still a ticket. She could go use it. But it's only alleged. I might have sent her anything. And so by doing the get exclusive from the issuer, she knows that the venue's validator of tickets for the venue will confirm 
if that's a real ticket. And so what she gets out in ticket is not just confirmation that it is a real ticket for the actual concert, but now she also knows that she's the older, ho only holder of it, right? She gets a purse where the original ticket that might have had many people accessing it, many people sharing it, now all of the contents have been transferred to this newly created purse, and so she has exclusive access to those rights, and so she has exclusive access to the ticket for the concert, right? Um, and she has that by construction. She just did that. Now she knows that that's the property that she has. And then, given that she succeeded at that, she will return the payment. If that failed, of course, it throw it an error, and she doesn't, and she doesn't end up uh, paying me for, my, for, for sending her the ticket. So what did I do on the, down below? There's the sample where I sent her her ticket. Um, her response is the payment. I then go and deposit that into my account. That gets the same kind of thing as get exclusive, which the deposit succeeds, if and only if it's, it's in the currency I was expecting. It's in the currency of my account. And it will deposit that and transfer that into my account. So now I know I have all the money, and she succeeded at paying. OK. Now, that's clearly got some problems. What if she doesn't pay me? She's got the ticket, right? I'm out the ticket. She, you know, she's, she's able to go to the concert and might not pay me or might not pay me enough or what have you. Well, that's where, remember I said, this is low-level programming using objects and just starting to build up to market abstractions that we can use to put together smart contracts. What we really all want is these are the tools to go into building a framework. And so what are the elements of a framework, right? I showed you before with the ticket I created this new right, which is the right to go to the concert, right? I just manufactured that by having a mint and able to stamp those things out. Similarly, I could start an auction, and now the seat on the auction is a brand new right that didn't exist before that I can now buy and sell and trade. And what you want is for that to be a bearer right that I can buy and sell and trade and, 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 and use in other market institutions. But to solve my problem with sending Carol this ticket and not getting paid, instead I want a contract that allows an arrangement over existing rights. So I already have the ticket right. I want to, in, I want to sell it to her through an escrow exchange, right? Because obviously my concert is so precious. Okay, so I want to sell it through an escrow exchange. So I create an escrow contra contract. I instantiate it by saying, you know, new escrow exchange. And here's my ticket. And that's what I make available to Carol. Carol puts the money in. The escrow exchange is a contract that many people have validated and used in a wide variety of other contracts. And so now when it gets both resources, it does the commit and swap, delivers me the money, delivers Carol the ticket. So now by composition, I'm able to write my, my participation in the, in the concert. I don't have to worry very hard about how it is that I'm going to manage the money or how I protect myself from people who are going to walk away and take tickets but not pay me because I just use this other already built contract, plug it into my system, and it will ensure that I only give away the tickets to people who pay, and it will provide my customers assurance that they only pay for tickets that they receive. Right? And this allows decentralized exchange of those tickets. You know, the kind of thing where right now you have to do it centralized on a stub hub, now you can do a decentralized kind of thing using this style of framework. Similarly, I mentioned earlier, right, writing a smart contract, another kind of contract that manipulates existing rights, is writing a smart contract that will sell it, that will sell whatever the underlying right is for a fixed price over a period of time. And that can have, you know, one time I write it, one time I sort out all the cancellation and timing and, and, and those sorts of things. And now, again, going back to the difference of this security architecture versus an identity-based access control architecture, I don't have to put your name in the covered call, it's just a thing. And I can sell it to you, I can send it to you, I can sell it to you through an escrow exchange agent, I can post it on a new auction that someone built, etc. So I've got this ability to build these market abstractions and then reuse them to build yet more sophisticated market abstractions. Okay, so what we've seen is an example of how one could potentially manipulate rights easily, right? Maneuver, move them around, share them with each other, make them exclusive, transfer them, and so forth. Um, we are, we're able to straightforwardly create new rights, and especially by default, those new rights that we create are themselves bearer instruments, so they are full participants in the economy. We can build an economy in the same way that our, that our existing economy is businesses layered on businesses leveraging businesses. We can have contracts built on contracts layer using other contracts. 
And so we can build the future economy that we would like the world to move into, and, we've, and we can empower all of these other developers out there to, to use this model in any of several languages. Our system, our platform that we're building, is in a secure subset of JavaScript that uses this model so that 20 million programmers would have the ability in the future to write smart contracts. Thank you very much. Uh, one of the cool things about blockchain, the way we think about it, we originally, as I was saying, we did smart contract technology before blockchain, and that was cryptographic protocols between machines, where I could then find a cluster of machines that I was willing to rely on mutually with you. We could deploy our contract to there and engage in, in escrowed exchange and all that sort of stuff. What blockchains brought is essentially now they can manufacture new machines out of agreement rather than out of silicon. And so from our perspective, a blockchain kind of looks like a machine that just has an incredibly high integrity. And, um, uh, and so um, uh, on that environment, we would be running that kind of, these kinds of transactions deployed where it's running replicated computation with consensus verification that all of those machines in a distributed fashion are doing the same contract execution. And I think I forgot a part of your question. Could you re-ask it? Ah, okay, right. Right, right. Okay, so, so the reason I brought the, gave that example is because one of the things is, in some sense, the kernel on each machine is executing deterministically, and we verify that they did the same thing, so they're checking each other. But we, for JavaScript, so, so our semantics are on JavaScript, and so we just completed a collaboration with Salesforce to do the production security kernel that's now deployed, and under, it's underneath the Salesforce Lightning platform, and it's the kernel of our system, to provide essentially featherweight compartments where we can launch programs, give them very limited authority, and allow them to communicate through that, but strictly according to the object capability principles. And so that's called SES, it's on our site, it's open source, and uh, Salesforce is just one of the companies that are starting to pick it up to use it in Web2 properties for security, but it is, it is underpinning our model for executing um, this, this kind of technology on, on, uh, in a smart contract platform. And so that runtime would be running on each of the validators or each of the miners in order to compute the smart contract result. And there's a subset of JavaScript that we can compile called, called Jesse that we can run on other platforms. We can write implementations in, you know, for example, OCaml for Tezos or, um, or EVM. Okay.